Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. A dervish once asked his sheikh, he said, Sheikh, what is a dervish? And the sheikh responded, a dervish is a lamplighter. In the days before electricity, to keep lights in the streets, there were people called lamplighters who had long sticks with fire at the end of them. And they would go around town lighting the lamps with the fire on the end of their stick. Like that, a dervish ignites lamps. The lamp that he ignites is the lamp of the soul. And that's the work of the dervish, to ignite souls, to bring those who have not yet understood the nature of reality into understanding the nature of reality. To light the fire within the chest of people so that they too can come forward with a true understanding of reality. We, over the last few months, have truly begun to understand how fragile life is and how unpredictable events are in this world. If anybody were to tell you last year what we were going to go through from uh, April through now in almost all of the world, no one would have given it much thought or no one would have believed it. But yet, here we are in the middle of this situation, reacting to this situation in an entirely new way for most of us. Uh, we haven't had uh, a worldwide quarantine in uh, human history. We haven't had a worldwide quarantine in the memory of any of us. It's quite, a, quite an amazing set of circumstances and quite an amazing situation. But just as quickly as this quarantine came about, this quarantine can end and will be released from our individual prisons at home, but we'll be entering into a new world, a new external world, a different way of doing things, a different way of interacting, and we'll begin to establish new customs. Uh, one of the customs that we're going to be establishing is that we're going to be wearing face masks when we go out in public, something that we truly haven't done in the U.S. But, you know, parts of the world have already been wearing face masks for a while. And there are going to be lots of other changes. And man will adjust to these external changes just as he has always adjusted to these external changes that come about. But one of the things that what has happened recently should make us very aware of, very cognizant of, is that we don't know what the future holds. And since we don't know what the future holds, we really should understand 
that we shouldn't project ourselves into the future. A definition of worrying that I found to be profound and to the point was, worrying is feeling future pain now. Now, why would we get involved in that sort of a thing? Why we, would we get involved in creating pain for ourselves? Why would we get involved in thinking about what we don't know is going to happen and giving it some kind of negative implication? What we should understand is that we don't know what's going to happen in the future. And we shouldn't allow the projections that our mind makes as to what is going to happen in the future influence us. We should hold strong and steady to the understanding that Allah is merciful. And anything that is going to happen in the future is going to be merciful and is going to be joyous and kind for us. The emotions that we feel now and the ideas that we have now and the feelings that we have now are going to influence the feelings that we have at the next moment. So in order to have a future that is merciful and kind, we have to have a now that is merciful and kind. So we need to concentrate on being in this moment and being joyous in this moment. Being joyous in this moment is the best guarantee that we have of being joyous in the next moment. So we shouldn't wish for joy, we should become joy. And we should become joy now. We should become love now. We need to be able to enter into the gracious qualities now. And then we can be in the gracious qualities in the future. The prophets all came, and the usual number that is said by uh, the teachers is that there have been 124,000 of them. They came to bring to us the news of Allah, the news of one God, the news of his mercy and his gracious qualities. And they have told us that we, his creation, are created in his image. And since God has no form, his image is his qualities, his gracious nature. And his gracious nature is capable of being transformed to us, transported to us. And this is the point of the sheikhs. The sheikhs come as manifestations of God's love. And they carry this lamplighter's torch and they light us on fire. They light our souls on fire. They give us, co they give us cognizance of what we are in truth, what we are capable of being. And the gracious sheikhs, the ones with tremendous insight, <clears throat> don't treat us as we are. They treat us as the best that we can become. They know that within us, there is much more than we ourselves 
recognize. They know that within us are all of the universes. When Allah created man, he created man as the exemplar of everything that he created. So we have the lowest and the highest within us. And we are capable of going from low to high. The intention that we should put together is to go high and to stay high. When Moses took the people from Egypt and he was wandering with them in the Sinai desert, he was told to climb Mount Sinai. The climbing is a symbolic understanding of going from low to high. The word was given to Moses up high in Mount, on top of Mount Sinai. It wasn't given to him in a flat place. It was given to him in a high place. When Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was in Mecca, he would climb Jabal Nur to meditate. And I know many of you have been to Jabal Nur. I've been to Jabal Nur. I've been to the cave where this happened. And from up there, there's a vantage point where you can see most of Mecca. Now, the story goes that Mount, the top of Mount Sinai was transferred to the top of the mountain called Jabal Nur, so that in reality, Moses, Musa, was given the scripture on top of Mount Sinai, and Muhammad was given the first revelation on top of Mount Sinai. So Muhammad also climbed from the lowest depths to the highest points. And the fact that Mount Sinai was moved to the top of Jabal Nur's, Jabal Nur shows you the consistency between the prophets, the consistency within the teachings, the consistency of God's word coming over and over again to influence humanity to also climb higher. So just as the prophets climbed to the top of the mountain, we have to climb to the top of the mountain. We have to climb to the upper levels of our consciousness. We have to leave the animal self and we have to enter into wisdom. And we have to understand what it is that has to be done to enter into wisdom. As Moses, Musa, was climbing Mount Sinai, his, his mind went to his wife, who was pregnant. And while he was climbing, he was worried about her. He was worried about her pregnancy, and the state of her being, and the state of her health. And Allah called to Moses. He called Musa. And Musa was so wrapped up in thought, his own thought, his own mind, that he didn't respond. Allah called again, Musa. And again, Moses didn't respond. Allah called a third time. He called Musa, and Musa heard and answered. And Allah said, Musa, you have been lost, and your concentration 
was in your mind. Now, I'm sure all of us are very much aware of being lost in our minds, of our mind taking over and obsessing over some specific thing and that obsession leading to worry and that worrying <clears throat> bringing us to a point that we lose confidence, we lose the fact that Allah is taking care of everything and our worrying isn't dispositive of what's going to happen. Allah said to Musa while he was climbing, he said to him, next to you, next to your foot, is a stone. Kick the stone. And he did. And underneath the stone, there was a frog. And next to the frog, there were a few blades of grass, and they had dew on them. So Allah said to Musa, he said, look, there's the frog you did not know about. And the frog has water and food. Who supplied this? I supplied all of it. I will take care of your wife. You have an obligation to me now, and you should follow through on that obligation to me. You have to keep your concentration on me. And this is a lesson for all of us. All of our situations will be resolved by Allah. Everything that bothers us or troubles us or causes us to lose connection with truth by getting wrapped up in our mind and wrapped up in the worrying process is unnecessary. Allah will take care of things. And we have to release ourselves from the chains of worry and the chains of difficulty and the chains of thinking that things are hopeless or not going in the way that they can. And we have to stop putting ourselves in those kinds of states. By doing that, we open ourselves up to God's grace and God's glory. But by worrying we and, and losing ourselves in the torpor of our mind, we lose our connection to Allah. We lose our connection to reality. We lose our connection to the truth. And we create veils for ourselves that separate us from God. We create veils that separate us from the glorious nature of Allah's qualities. Now, this is easily said. Words are easily spoken. Words are easily read. Words are easily written down. However, to change ourselves so that we can be joyous in the face of adversity is an entirely different situation. And this is the work that we have to do. We have to learn how to become joyous in the face of adversity. We have to learn how to become joyous in the face of difficulty. We have to learn how to become joyous when our mind keeps telling us not to be joyous. You have to understand Satan's <clears throat> techniques and Satan's attitudes and what Satan is looking to do. Satan is trying to keep us in a state of torpor, to keep us in a state of worry, to keep us in a state of discontent, to keep us in a state 
where we lose consciousness of the fact that God exists and surrounds us and is everywhere around us and is constantly aiding and assisting and giving to us. Now, the least that we are all given is our breath. Yet, without that, nothing else would actually matter. I've been in a situation more than once where I couldn't breathe. And at those moments, the only thing you think about is, will I be able to breathe again? <laughs> will breath come back to me? So when you've gone through things like that, you begin to understand how fragile the world is and how unimportant all of the worries that we have are. And so we have to learn to give up worrying. We have to learn to give up fear. We have to learn to give up doubt. The holy books, the scriptures, the prophets, the ketubs, all have come to dispense a word to us that we need not fear, to give us resolve that we need not fear, to give us the courage that we need not fear, to give us the certitude that we need not fear. So, my sheikh put these into three words. He said, we have to have faith, certitude, and determination. So we have to believe. We have to believe strongly. And we have to maintain that strong belief through constant vigilance and constant setting our intention on that point. Through a constant interaction within ourselves to keep the light of the soul ablaze so that we are in contact with our Lord. The outside is constantly going through changes. The outside is constantly altering. World events are constantly going on in strange ways. If we look back at recorded history, we will see that somewhere in the world, <clears throat> there's always war going on. There's always terrorism going on. There's always some sort of chaos going on. Internally, we have to make sure that we are protecting ourselves from that chaos. The world beckons you, it asks you, it pleads with you, get involved in the chaos. Allah says, get involved in peace internally. Get involved in joy internally. Learn to sit still and be removed from the world. We can't be involved and active in the chaos of the world and at the same time be calm, serene, patient inside. Sufism developed in places called dargas. Dargas were a bit like monasteries where the dervishes would live with their sheikh and they would 
sometimes have farms which they would cultivate. They would supply food for themselves. Um, they would live a life cloistered within the confines of their darga, the confines of their monastery. We, when we were with Bawa, all lived in our own homes. However, in a very interesting way, we were cloistered. Our attention was focused on our teacher and our inclination and intention was always to be near him whenever possible. So before I lived in Philadelphia, I used to drive 70 miles a week each way to be at his discourses. And I did this on Tuesday, Thursday, and then on the weekends I stayed in Philly. Eventually he asked me to move to Philadelphia. But the point is that the chaos of the world, the chaos of my work, all of that was left behind and stopped so that I could make the trip to Philadelphia and sit in the small circle around my sheikh. Now, when I went to these meetings, if there were 200 people there, 250 people, that was a lot. So there was a very, very small number of people who had found this oasis of truth and who had made it their intention to go to this oasis of truth and had made it their intention to live around this oasis of truth. But for the ones who did, they were lifted. They were reminded. They were constantly talked to about who they truly were and who they were becoming and would become. And that's true for all of us. We are much more than we are cognizant of. We're much more than we are aware of. And all of this will come to the forefront to each of us if we set our intention towards knowing the true part of ourselves. As long as we concentrate on this body and taking care of this body and taking care of this body's needs and feeding the mind and desire and chasing all of the things that desire puts in front of us, as long as we do that, we will have a harder time getting to the core of reality, getting to the essence of who we are. But if we begin to look at who we truly are and concentrate on the internal nature of our soul and the internal connection, then things will begin to change. Imagine that as opposed to an elemental physical body, you are a light body. And in truth, you are a light body. It's just the physicality of yourself that you carry around with you wherever you go, the image that you see in the mirror makes you believe that there's reality to it. Somehow, we have to begin to understand that what the eyes see and what the ears hear is not what's real. There is a separate reality that we are part of. And 
we need to find that separate reality. And as long as we stay in the reality of the elemental forms, we are holding ourselves back from Hak, God's reality. In the reality of the elemental forms, there's right and wrong. There's good and evil. In creation, when Allah created the elements, within the elements, there were certain things that they produced. Fire was needed in order for creation to occur. And fire has certain elemental um, qualities within it that lead towards inappropriate behavior. Air was used. Air has certain elements within it that lead towards inappropriate behavior. The earth has certain elements within it that lead toward inappropriate behavior. Water has certain elements within it that lead towards inappropriate behavior. So we have a mix within us of elemental elements that came together to make this form that inherently within them create difficulty and create inappropriate things happening. We need to lose our connection to the elemental and return to the connection to the light. Light is without the elements. Light is different. In the world, there is day and night. In the world of light, there is only light. There is only day. There is only brightness. There is no night. So we need to go from duality, the duality of day and night, to the reality of brightness, to the reality of light being there for us all the time. And this is what the prophets came to tell us, what the Ketubs came to tell us, what the friends of God came to tell us, that you are, we are all light beings. We came from that world of light, and we will return to that world of light. But if you live in the animal world, if you live in your lower self, and you don't move out of that lower self, you're never going to recognize it. And we need to recognize it. We need to understand that the light exists. So no matter how dark or chaotic the world appears, the light is adjacent to it. It's right next to us. Or as the wise men say, it's closer to you than your carotid artery or jugular vein. It's closer to you than your own blood flow. It's closer to you than you can imagine. And what you need to begin to imagine is that it's that close to you. You have to think in that way. You have to think in that direction. You have to think with that intention. You have to think to make that your reality. So instead of darkness, our reality has to become light. Instead of darkness, our reality has to become glorious. Instead of fear, our reality has to become the praise of Allah. Instead of fear, we have to understand that we are being held up by the greatest power in the universe, 
the power of the Creator. And He is here as the support for each of us. He knows each of us. He is in touch with each of us. He is within each of our hearts. He placed Himself there because of His interest in us. Now, the Sheikh, when we were in front of the Sheikh, was able when we were sitting with him to give us his absolute full attention as if we were the most important thing in creation. Allah is in your heart because he is giving you full attention and you are the most important thing in creation. He made you that way and he wants you to know him. Allah created us to know him. Allah created us to become like him. Allah created us to share in the glory of the gracious qualities that are God's. Allah created us to be glorious. And we should not remove our glory. We should not ignore our glory. We should not look at our glory and wonder if it's true or not. It's true. You are glorious. God made you glorious. And the joy in that glory should be overwhelming. We should be dancing in the streets. We should be playing instruments, pro proclaiming that joy. We should, all of us, be writing poetry to Allah, telling him of our love for him and our gratitude to him for what he's done on our behalf. So, in this chaotic world, we need to find a place of reality. We need to be able to remove ourselves from the ongoing craziness that surrounds us and from ongoing insistence by the media and by the televisions and by all of the news outlets that report chaos as if chaos were the ongoing nature of what's around us. You know, I watched uh, some websites uh, by religious organizations that concentrate on the marvelous, happy uh, things that are also going on in the world at the same time that all this chaos is going on. And they make you cry. The incredible uh, interactions between people, the incredible aid that people give to each other, the incredible goodness that exists out there is ignored for the sake of that which is um, uh, more spectacular. Uh, news is essentially about what's wrong. It's not about what's right. And so you should all understand that the news is only covering a small portion of what is actually going on. What's going on that's appropriate and right is mostly ignored, and you don't get that in the mass media. But when I was younger, we used to find the truth with about 200 or so other people in a small room in Philadelphia, hidden from the rest of the world. And that's the way the truth is. The truth is hidden in those who have the capacity to hold it. And it should be our intention to be with those hidden ones, to be with those who have the capacity to hold the truth within them, and to be able to light the truth within you. And then we have to become the ones who take that truth and light it in others. We have to become the bearers of the torches that bring truth 
into the world. It is our responsibility as ones who have been lit to carry that torch of Allah's light throughout the world. And in reality, even in this dunya, even in this world, there are many, many, many people who understand that truth and who carry that truth and who haven't abandoned Allah's glory to the chaos of the world, who understand that in the midst of chaos, glory exists and they keep that glory within them. We need to understand that and to do that. And we have to let go of doubt. One of Bauer's expressions uh, in English was, doubt is out. And doubt should be out for each of us. Reality is here. Reality is real. Ya Allah, O oh, merciful, compassionate one, O oh, one whom we trust in all ways and in all matters, O oh, creator and sustainer, O oh, the one who gives us breath and gives us life, we prostrate before you, we give ourselves to you, we surrender our will to your will, we lose ourselves so that we can find you. In this loss of self, the reality of existence comes into being. In this loss of self, the truth comes into us and we come to know it. This self is the veil that separates us from that truth. O oh Allah, take away these veils so that we know you. Our intention is to know you. The only treasure in this existence is you. Yet we wander and look for things that have no meaning. May our focus and our intention be the truth. May it be one focused towards you. May faith, certitude, and determination sit within us in great strength so that we have the courage to move forward towards you. And may your kindness guide us and bring us closer to you. Take us on the straight path to you without deviation, without detours. We're ready, Lord. We're ready to see you. We're ready to know you. We're ready for you, Allah. Be ready for us, please. Allow us to be worthy to be counted among your friends. Allow us to be true lovers of mankind, lovers of each other, and lovers of you. Allah, do this for us now. Amin, amin, ya Rabbi Lala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.